Alrighty. Hey gang. Welcome back. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about rocket stove benches and uh, some different methods you can use to build those and how mine's working on the tiny cook stove and uh, try and answer some of your questions. Hugh, this is partly for you. Thanks for asking such good questions. The rest of you guys for building these. Uh, let me just start by saying thank you so much for your uh, interest and enthusiasm and uh, for anyone who's interested in purchasing plans and building one of these I want to let you know when you purchase plans I'm here to help you make sure uh, that you succeed on your build so um, I've been communicating with a lot of folks working on some <clears throat> mistakes that I've made and helping smooth out the process and trying to figure out what information um, you guys need to help you guys build these so uh, yeah I just wanted to say I'm having a lot of fun interacting with all of you um, and thank you very much. It's really, really, really rewarding for me to know that you guys are out there building those. So, let's talk about benches. Um, here's mine, and you guys have seen it before. A um, few things to talk about. So, the first is we've got a couple different ways of running the flue gases through the bench, right? One is your standard rocket mass heater flue path, which means you usually have flue pipe that comes out of the core. Uh, and or out of the barrel or whatever and enters the bench and usually has a circuitous route circuitous? I don't know how you say that circuit route through the bench and then hits the exit and goes up and out and so what that does is that just means the flue gases move um, in a progressive manner progressing from one end to the next through the bench to find the exit so that has its benefits it has its pros and cons um, the other method that we use that I'm using here is something called a bell and that is a hollow empty void and it relies on stratification to allow the warm gases to flow to all areas of the bench so um, let's see if I can explain that to you a little bit better than just kind of talking about it um, what do I got here I'm gonna pause this Alrighty, I got some chalk pens, so maybe we'll see if we can do some illustrating here. I don't, this isn't my specialty, but we'll try. So, <clears throat> we talk about a, be a bell, we're talking about a big hollow chamber that fills with the exhaust gases and uses stratification to distribute the um, heat throughout the bell. So the way that works is very much like a pool of water and and warm water and cool water stratifying work in the same way using the same principles so a good way to envision a bell and the way it might work if you're building one is to just invert it and flip it upside down and uh, picture how it would fill with warm water how warm water would drain out or, or fill it up and where the cold spots would be and stuff like that so if we think about just a chamber like this Okay, this is our pool of water. So we're gonna fill that with water. And I got the wrong colors here, but that's okay. As you guys know, warm water is gonna be up here on the top when things settle out. And down lower, we'll have some cool water. Okay, so we pour warm water in and it mixes and eventually settles, stratifies, so and separates so that the warm is on top and the cool is on bottom, right? So if we want to get the cool air out of here, what do we do? We just put a hole here, right? And now the water is going to drain out here and it's going to be cool water draining off the bottom and the warm water is going to stay on top. Okay? If we want to get the warm water out and keep this part cool, what do we do? We leave this blocked and we maybe make a little hole right here. And now what we've got is we've got warm water coming out and the cold water stays down there. Okay, so I'm not the best at explaining that, but as you can see, the stratification means that the water separates into layers dictated by temperature. So if we just flip that over 
we get ourselves a rocket stove bench, right? Let's say we got our barrel here. And our firebox. That's a pretty bad firebox, Maddie. That'll work though. And hot gases come out of here and they flow into here, right? And they warm up the top, okay? Using stratification. Now, even though the gases are coming in here, as long as there's no exit up high over around here, this is just going to flow and it's going to fill this up. And when I say fill it up, it's going to fill it down, right? It's going to go this way. The warm, gas, the warm gases are filling and as we get more full, we go lower and lower. And as they start to give their heat to the bench top, they start to cool. Okay? Now, if we want to maximize the way this heat distributes through this bench and stays in this bench, if we think about these exo exits, what do we want to do? We want to make an exhaust that exits down low, right? Because now we're going to spill this cool gas out. And of course, we're exhausting up now. <laughs> but the cool gases, the cooler ones are going to come out and the warmer gases are going to stay up here. So by doing that, we increase dwell time of the warm gases against your mass so you get more transfer. You also extract only the coolest gases. Now in a flue pipe system where we have a circuit, it would be the same drawing and we would go in one end through a flue pipe and out the other. It doesn't quite work that way. The gases just whip through there and then they go out the chimney. So they could still have some heat in them. Uh, they may not dwell as long along the top. So a bell means that you get really efficient extraction. You get calm flue gases in there so there's not a lot of motion. They can transfer heat very easily to the outsides. <clears throat> and you have this great means of distributing gases without having to physically guide them with flue pipe or other physical obstructions. So, as you can see, we want the exhaust down low to get the warm gases to stratify up top. But it doesn't matter where it is. I put it at this end. That isn't because the heat is going to flow out here. It just has to be lower. So in other words, I could have this exhaust right here next to the bench, next to the barrel, going up. And as long as it's lower than the end... Sorry about that. My battery died. Ain't that how it goes. <laughs> okay, so where was I? I don't know where it died. But uh, at any rate, if we want to get the flue gases to dwell in the bench, stratify, and still get them out, we can put this exhaust over here by the firebox and by the barrel or by the cook stove or whatever this is. As long as our flue entrance is above the level of our flue exit, then the gases are going to come in through that higher entrance and they're going to stratify and they're going to stay up here and they're going to put that heat into your bench top. And then as they go down, they'll slowly cool until they find their way out. But they won't do that until they've done this through the whole elevation. So this bench, if we were looking at it from a top view, it could be around a corner like this. We could have our barrel here. We could have our exhaust here. This bench could be hollow. Okay. But because of this stratification, it has to fill this whole top layer with hot gas before it can find this exhaust, even though it's right next to where it's coming from. So that's how bells work. So hopefully that helps you guys understand a little better. I know um, some of that can be a little hard to wrap your head around at first. Um, but I prefer them. They're much easier to build. Uh, they do perform extremely well. Um, they don't require the clean outs and they don't clog up like the flue pipes do. There's a lot less material to buy and, and mess with. Um, and you guys have done this before, know that <laughs> snapping that stove pipe together is one of the worst jobs there is in, in stove building. So as funny as that sounds, it's just a simple thing. Um, but there's a lot of good reasons to use a bell type system. Now a flue system is pretty good as well. I mean, there isn't, I'm not 
picking on it. It isn't bad. I have, still love the flu system in my big house, and, and uh, it has always worked really well. But they do require cleaning. I don't think they're as efficient. Um, and they take a lot of mud. You know, with a flu system, you just got to pack it in cob. So, um, and that brings me to another point. Let's talk about materials for benches. That's enough about bells and, and flute pipe. I think you guys probably understand that. So materials for benches. So, you know, traditionally we've got cob, brick, um, stone, high mass type things. If you're doing a flue pipe type run, the only reason to do that is if you are using that flue pipe to heat thermal mass to use as your storage battery. Well, that's not true. That's not the only reason. You might just want a warm place to sit for a short time. So I apologize. Um, I've done a lot of low mass benches outside where you want to light a fire and have heat out quick. So there is a reason to have a low mass bench as well. But for the most part, a high mass bench is what you want because you want thermal storage because the stove burns fast and short and you're going to save that heat so the house is warm later on. So in my opinion, if you're building a flue run bench, don't shortchange yourself. Use cob, use brick. If you use stone, you gotta fill in the gaps with, with rock. Um, I strongly discourage the use of any loose material, sand, pebbles, gravel. Those are awful mass, in my opinion. We've tested them, uh, Peter and I, in, in a few different um, episodes. I've done uh, builds myself with some of that stuff and done tests, and it's insulative. So it's the opposite of what you want. If you want something to sit on that's warm while you're having the fire, that's one thing. If you think it's going to store heat, um, or I'm sorry, if you're looking for heat storage and thermal mass, I would encourage you to use something else. So there's mass. Now, another, uh, some more materials discussion. The outer sides of the bench, um, what contains the bench. So in a traditional rocket mass heater, we've always done cob benches with flue pipe inside in order to get some nicer finishes or some more um, refined shapes. I've done things like hardy backer, you know, hardy board benches. Um, those can then be have flue pipe in them and filled with cob. That gives you a nice surface on the outside for tile or any kind of surfacing. I see people wanting to use wood. Uh, I'm going to strongly recommend that you don't. I don't believe wood has any place on a heater. Um, I think it's a terrible idea uh, if only for your peace of mind. Now, I've got combustibles near mine. You do get to the point where you've been around your stove a long time and you know what's safe and you know what you're comfortable with. So I'm not saying I think every piece of wood near a stove is a terrible idea, but as a general rule of thumb, if you're thinking about building something, I know we're all familiar with wood. Don't be scared of masonry. Don't be scared of, of brick. It's really easy. You guys, it's easier than wood in my opinion. It's like playing with Legos. So um, give yourself a shot um, at trying something new and building yourself a stove that has mass and is going to give you heat. If you build a rocket stove with no mass, you're going to be disappointed, I promise. Um, so, okay, there's that. Let's talk about the bench itself. Um, as you can see, I've got a cushion on mine. Um, that I got at Costco. It's like one of those lounge chair cushions, and uh, it works really well. Um, I like it a lot. It's pretty hot over here, the stove body itself is pretty warm. And uh, so I did, was concerned about it being on there all the time. Um, it's quite hot right there, but so far so good. So I do monitor, I don't leave it there when I leave the house, I do peel it back. I do leave it here, it doesn't seem to get hot enough to, to cause any problems. Um, but that's what I do for my cushion. And here's the bench itself. So my bench is a bell, okay? My bench is just a big hollow trough made out of brick. I changed to stone at this end because I ran out of brick and because I had the stone. I use these flagstone for the tops. Um, I think they're about two inches thick, maybe a little more, two and a half. That's two. So two inches thick um, flagstone. These are, that's pretty thick. They, they're warm, but they don't transfer a lot. They don't really push a lot of heat out because they have so much mass they're storing a lot. That said, they just kind of ride real steady for a long time. Again, they're not terribly warm. I have my bench opening mostly restricted at this point, um, but I do have, you won't be able to see this, 
but this is a Accurite <clears throat> um, weather sensor inside thermometer type thing, and it has a pro. There's a cable going down here, and it goes into that bench, and it's all the way out here at the very end of the bench, and it's about two inches down below the surface of these stones. So out here at the very end of this bench, uh, the fire's just about out. It burned this morning. It's, oh, it's like 1.30 now in the afternoon, so it's been out for a little while. But inside the bench, way out here, is 91 degrees. Okay, that's the air inside, the flue gas inside. So with a bell-type bench, and actually with any bench, the faces really never get very warm. They're warmer than room temperature, but they don't get hot. Um, and that's pretty much the norm. Usually the heat is just in the top part of the bench, depending on how you built it and your thicknesses and stuff. If you have flue pipe and it's right out here by the edge, you will get hot. But for the most part, if it's buried back in there, it's going to come out through the top. So let's take a look at some temperatures. The stove body itself is the hottest part right over here on this side where the downdraft section is. I know that the hottest spot is about two bricks down right there, and it's just 200 degrees right on the money right there. Okay. As I move down, <clears throat> I'll just call it out to you. I'm down on the, I'm down about here now. You guys aren't going to be able to see this, but that's uh, oh, 210. I guess that's the hottest spot. And now we're coming down, and I'm about at the bench height now, and I'm 185, 170 down um, about a foot off the floor in the corner there. And as I get down to the floor, now I'm sitting on a wood floor, and I've got insulated fire brick, so. Way down there, I'm, I'm not even 100 degrees. The floor is 95. And the face of the bench, right here in the corner. Now this is where my flue gases go into the bench and it's also adjacent to and joined to the hottest part of the bench or the hottest part of the stove. So that's gonna be probably the hottest bench face and it's about 130 degrees right there. As I move out, I'm going down. I'm now 80, 80 degrees out here at about the middle of the bench, both height and length. And then all the way out there at the end, I should see just kind of room temperature. Yeah, it's like 66 down there on the floor out there. Now on top of the bench, way over here, there's a little seat back here. And that's going to be pretty darn warm. That's about 110 degrees back there. Out here in the warmest seat, it's about 95 right here. Okay? Right here, just about 80 and then all the way out there, I'm down to about 70. So it is tapering off. As I said, the flue gases, I know that the inside of there, they're 90, okay? So it's really hot in here, you guys. It's 82 in my little shack right now. It's 40 outside. It was 35 or so last night. Um, <clears throat> if it were colder and it were midwinter, I would be burning longer. As you can see, it's 91 in there, so we've got good temperature inside the bench. That's about what I want. I don't want this bench a whole lot more than that. Well, I've run it up to about 120 on the internal temperature, and I've had about 120 on the top over here. Um, but that's just about right. Much more than that, and too, sitting on it for too long starts to become uncomfortable. If it feels really good when you first sit down on it, like really warm, you won't be able to stay there long. You want it to be sort of just emanating warmth gently into your bones is what I prefer anyway. So. Um, that seems to be about right for me. If it were a flue run bench, I would expect it to heat a little more evenly, length to length. Um, but I also would probably expect it to exhaust at a higher temperature and I would have less extraction and less um, efficiency. So let's talk about cleanouts uh, real quick. So, and the tops. So the tops on this bench are flagstone, like I said, they're about two inches thick and they're about 24 inches square. Now you could do this with concrete slabs, you can go purchase stone, um, you could do hardy backer and tile with some metal L um, angle iron supports or something like that under there. There's a lot of ways to put a top on. With the bell, what I recommend doing is just doing it the way I did where you have these sections that go down and then you seal them with your sand and clay mortar. In that way, I can just pick this up one top, open it up to get in there and inspect and clean. There isn't going to be a lot of cleaning in a bell like this. It could fill up <laughs> for years before there was any um, any downside. As a matter of fact, I think some ash on the bottom is good to help insulate the bottom. <clears throat> so 
it isn't necessary to install clean outs in the side. We don't need those metal pieces, um, but it is important to maintain access through the top. Now, if it were a flue run bench, of course, we'd want to put tees and, and caps and clean outs in there. And again, that's another reason I prefer the bells. They're just a lot easier, a lot less finicky, a lot less parts and pieces, and less um, potential for leaking as well. So <clears throat> there's that part of that, um, tops, clean outs. I think that pretty much covers the bench. Um, you know, these flagstone I did cut just with a hammer uh, and was able to make shapes that fit my bench so don't be scared of, of going and finding stone at your local masonry supply tapping it with a hammer check out YouTube there's some good stone cutting um, videos and uh, it's pretty darn fun to uh, to make stone tops for these things so I highly recommend that method um, it worked well for me now if you are purchasing plans for me and uh, you know you need some help making a custom system just let me know the, I didn't include the bench details measurements because I know everyone's space is different so some people are putting them on the left side some out the back and other people are gonna do small bells and things like that um, <clears throat> so let me know if I can help you work out your design once you get your plans going and you and you dug in a little ways I'm happy to do that and uh, one more thing I should mention I did talk about benches and this bench is a bell but there's another method we could use another feature we could build as opposed to benches we could just build this as sort of a, a, a smaller footprint brick bell that was taller and in that way we could harvest a lot of heat out of a stove in a small footprint so <clears throat> while I have a bench for a bell and that's how the stove is designed you certainly could just stick another little side chamber on it use it as an oven if you wanted to but for the most part just use it as heat storage uh, so all right there you go thanks a lot for watching gang I really hope it answers some questions for you and as always thank you so much for your support and enthusiasm and uh, I am so excited watching you guys build these stoves. It is just incredibly rewarding. And uh, once again, thank you all very much. I really, really appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. See you next time.